Okay. So um, Bill Gary and I have been working on this. Uh, we're talking about um, the the next generation of, of AWIP's workstation. There are a lot of slides here that, that I can hopefully go through pretty quickly because we put this presentation together uh, for a lot of people up at up at Silver Spring who you know are you know some of them are budget people and and folks that might not be familiar with how you know the AWIPS workstation has evolved. So uh, you know a lot of this stuff. You know, you folks out there in the field will say, well, "Yeah, I, I already knew that." So, uh, you know, our our workstation is basically still modeled on the the old AGGG layout that that we uh, that we used on AFOS, dating back to the to the late '70s, and with uh, with our evolution into into AWIPS two and the the capabilities that Cave uh, gives us. It seems to be uh, a prime time uh, to us to redesign how our workstation works. Um, and some of these slides Bill put in here, so I'll have to look at them, you know, just real quick as we're going to remember what what he put in here. Uh, kind of folded into this process is is uh, uh, a reevaluation of the number of workstations that were put in at at each WFO. I know. It, a lot of works. A lot of WFOs were not given a sufficient number of workstations, especially for the way our jobs have have evolved over the years, and the the way they were uh, decided back when AWIPS was deployed were was this point based system, and you know, now that we're doing decision support and uh, and and sectorized uh, warnings, it um, it's time to reevaluate how we allocate those workstations. Uh, the uh, the current you know the current workstation uh, we we have the separate text workstation and that goes back to the original HP workstations where we you know we just had uh, the graphics on the the two big monitors and the separate X term and that that sort of functionality was was retained basically due to the way the AWIPS 1 software was written uh, when when we migrated to to Linux and now we're you know we're starting to think you know do we do we really need the uh, the the completely dedicated text workstation or could this or could this functionality be folded into the, the the functions of Cave and just the LX workstation, and you, you know before before your your mind starts reeling at that idea, you know we haven't 100% decided what we're going to do with the text workstation functionality. I've heard you know, there we're we're kind of collecting ideas about that right now, uh, but but we think that there may be a better way to operate. Uh, so yeah, you know, you guys know the history of the of the current workstation. So I'm I'm going to kind of breeze through this stuff. You know, but a, a key point on this slide is with our with our current layout, we've got this extra video card in the uh, in the LX workstations, and we've actually seen where that can create a, a little bit of resource bind in in AWIPS two because Cave. Actively uses the video card. AWIPS one doesn't really, and on the uh, uh, the the video card where two monitors are being driven, you're you're sharing the resources of that one video card, and and that can that can create some some issues under certain conditions. Um, once again, our our work environment has has evolved over the years. You know, with moving radar analysis into AWIPS and sectorized warnings and all these other things that, once again, you guys are familiar with with this stuff. But maybe some of the folks in in Silver Spring aren't uh, aren't completely aware of of how our jobs have have changed over the. You know, actually, it it's been. Uh, the better part of two decades now we've been operating on AWIPS, and when you know when you think about it like that, it really seems like it, it's time for us to kind of evolve the 
uh, the the work environment a little uh, you know our our hardware environment some and uh, service backup has has been something that's driven that you know quite a bit you know with with GFE and WarnGen you know you uh, you you just have more things you're doing now on on the workstations than when we first deployed AWIPS. And all these new tools that have come along also with uh, with FSI and Scan and and the the tear off menus and now we're you know we're bringing on uh, N Sharp in in AWIPS too. Uh, def uh, desktop space on the computer has has become uh, you know somewhat at a, at a premium and uh, a, a big problem in the AWIPS one environment is is our our lack of ability to drag uh, just the simple operation of being able to drag dialogues from one uh, from one monitor to the next that that would be a, a very very nice capability to have when you have that uh, that cell table from uh, uh, from scan or the you know FSI's windows to be able to move it wherever you want uh, in your your uh, desktop space on the on the workstation. So we need to to assess uh, how the human computer interface is working in the context of situational awareness and the warning and forecast process. And that's just kind of re-emphasizing the same thing. So the, this is getting into the meat of, of what I what I wanted to present to you all. The, the all the previous stuff was kind of background. Uh, in the in the new workstation that that we envision, uh, at least at the present time, is the the monitors wouldn't be discrete anymore in, in other words one continuous workspace where you can drag the dialogues back and forth uh, between those monitors go to two much much larger monitors like i said for example a 27 inch uh, monitor with a far higher uh, display resolution you know something in the in the 2560 uh, pixel range, so uh, you know you, you can find much larger monitors that are still at say a, a 1920 uh, uh, caliber of resolution, and you don't buy anything there because you're just stretching the pixels out over over a larger size. Uh, the idea is to eliminate the 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 separate text workstation and fold the text functionality. Perhaps in the cave itself, or or you know, we've we've had the the option thrown out there of of it still being a separate application, but with these far larger monitors, we could have we could have that functionality in the same workspace, and and not have to have two separate computers per work position. And uh, the uh, the benefits that we put together for uh, for the the offices is you know we we get a more efficient use of of our physical space. We only have one keyboard and mouse per work position instead of having to go back and forth between two keyboards and mice. Uh, we would actually decrease the uh, the amount of physical space that we would use per. Uh, per work position, but hopefully we uh, we generate a more efficient and and more productive work environment by having everything in you know one continuous workspace where you can move everything back and forth between uh, between the two monitors. Uh, what we're hoping is that uh, by Eliminating the XTs as being part of, you know, each work position. That some, not all of those, could be converted into LXs, so that we can create more work positions uh, for the WFO, but have fewer total PCs. And by having the larger monitors, you know, maybe we can. Uh, develop uh, some methods in CAVE 
you know, larger fonts and all these sorts of things to help uh, those employees that might be uh, uh, visually impaired. And by having the higher resolution monitors, you'd have the ability really to display more information in a given space uh, because of that, that, that higher resolution will allow uh, things to be sharper on, uh, on those, those higher resolution monitors. And of course, since we were presenting this to Silver Spring, we had to give some benefits to the agency, uh, which, which is good to all of us, because if, if we can save money in the long run, you know, that, that will help all of us in, in the long run. Uh, by having fewer machines, the, the maintenance and refresh costs hopefully go down over the long run. And by having fewer machines, we consume less power, and we put less heat out into the operations area, which uh, would, uh, would hopefully reduce our cooling demands. Uh, obviously, you know something this big would uh, would need a lot of testing, and and we we want to make it clear that you know we're we're not going forward with with any of this without getting lots of feedback from operational forecasters. You know we want to put these things into into some test beds first. You know we're thinking the operational proving ground here here at the region the hazardous weather test bed down in Norman, the test beds up in Silver Spring, and bring operational forecasters in, set them down in front of it, and hopefully have environments where we can have both the old and the new available so we can do some side-by-side -side sorts of testing and, and you know, get that frank and honest feedback of, of what we're doing and, and make sure that that we get good buy-in from the from the field before before we go ahead with uh, with anything like this. That's the uh, that's the end of the presentation. I know there was there was quite a bit to to digest there, and uh, I know a big part of that is uh, that text workstation functionality. And I you know I I want to let everybody know that. We're open to, to, to ideas uh, for how to do that, ha, uh, how to migrate that text functionality. But we think it's time that we, we don't really need to have a dedicated PC to doing basically nothing but creating, displaying, and transmitting text products. We, we think there, there's, there's got to be a better way to do this. And I, uh, I welcome any, any feedback that you all might have. Yeah, this is uh, Scott at the MBRFC. And I'm not sure if you're aware, but the RFCs have kind of gone to that paradigm for the last 10 years plus. Um, we use our XTs um, not as just standalone text workstations, but we actually use them as a lower powered uh, LX box where we pretty much can do almost everything we do on the LXs. So, um, the only thing we're concerned about is, as a cost-cutting move, getting rid of the standalone XT box or the text workstation box. Well, we heavily depend on those here uh, for operations since we have more than um, five or six people working at a time for a shift. We actually split up the XT boxes and the LX boxes to do our operations. So if those would go away, we would have a, a big problem here at the RFC. Well, and that's that's why uh, a part of this is is you know we we want to uh, reevaluate the uh, you know how many how many work positions and I, I try and I try and stick with the term work positions rather than work stations and when I think of a work position I, I think of you know where one person is sitting and interacting with a whips you know gra both graphically and textually and that that reevaluation needs to include both the WFOs and the RFCs because you know we we definitely don't want to take work positions away from any office where they where they need them so that that's why one of those slides we had in there was to uh, you know to do a reevaluation of how many work positions do all of the offices need in in today's environment and you know an environment you know that we might envision in the next several years. 
Okay, sounds good. I just uh, make sure that we uh, involve the actual individual offices on, in some type of survey or questionnaire on that. That'd be good. Yeah, and, and that's that's why you may you may have noticed in all the slides they all said you know WFO and RFC and and we were aware that the the RFCs had. Uh, quite some time ago, converted their their XTs into LX lights, if 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 you would would like to call them that. I, that's probably a pretty good term for them. Uh, so yeah, we know that there there are uh, considerations of the RFCs that don't apply to WFOs and vice versa, and we're we're keenly aware of that. Okay, great. Hey, Matt, this is Josh up in Bismarck. Hey, Has uh, WPC been experimenting with some version of this for for quite some time? I, I, not so much with killing the XT boxes, but with the larger screens and the implementation of AWIPS two. Yeah, uh, I know the the centers. I was uh, I was in Norman for seven years before I came up here, and I know that SPC. Uh, they they use like 24 inch monitors and they have for a long time, and actually that that's it's interesting that that came up. Uh, the, if I, I don't know if if uh, Omaha or Boulder is is on, but uh, a lot of the growing pains we've been experiencing with getting N Sharp into AWIPS two is because N Sharp was designed at the national centers on 24 inch monitors. And now we're trying to shoehorn it into 19-inch monitors, and it's it's been fraught with difficulties. And um, I, I've been working. I, I've talked with uh, uh, Greg Grosshands down at SPC, and and they're on board with this proposal because we could get um, we could get the the WFOs, RFCs, and national centers on a more common hardware platform uh, and, you know, and a more capable platform. And the other idea is that with, with these new LXs, we would, we would put way, way, way more memory in them uh, so, that the caves, uh, the, so that the caves will have plenty of memory to operate in. Because uh, you know, cave wants to use a, a lot of memory. And the, the more memory you give it, the happier it is. So, uh, you know, memory's memory's really pretty cheap. So we're going to try and make sure that there, you know, the the next generation of workstation has plenty of memory for the future. Anything else? Matt, yeah. this is Dan in Lacrosse. Um, yeah, I think this is a, a great idea and way overdue. Um, you know, we're constantly battling the screen number of screens with SA monitoring and PCs so this is long overdue what what is what realistically do you have an is there an ear for this um, at higher levels and what what kind of timeline are we talking about there we're uh, uh, we just well I, I said I presented this a couple months ago to uh, the folks at Silver Spring and it, it's it's an OSIP thing and we are we were approved through gate one of the OSIP process, which I don't know how many of you are familiar with that, but that's it's kind of just out the door. Now that said, I believe the LX workstations are due for a refresh in 15, and we're trying to uh, and that 2015, believe it or not, would actually be a fast track for this because we're trying to get this uh, ready to go for that for that 2015 refresh of the LXs and kind of kill two birds with one stone, you know, refresh the LX hardware and get uh, a new workstation configuration uh, out there. Matt, um, th this is Kim. I, I'm also trying to convince OST to uh, maybe support some uh, purchase of at least a few prototype options that we could test drive in the proving ground that might help fast track the process. Yeah, and we're we're working with John Tatum up at uh, up at headquarters uh, to try and also uh, secure 
I, I believe he was saying that he thought the AWIPS program, you know, could pretty easily, uh, at a at a minimum, get us one prototype workstation pretty quickly, and uh, we're we're hoping to uh, to do some other things with the acquisition of the hardware. Uh, just as an example, our uh, some of you may not be aware, but the the LX workstations have. Uh, uh, workstation grade video cards in them, like like CAD grade video cards, and those those video cards are really really expensive uh, because uh, Nvidia charges a premium for those CAD extensions in the video cards, and we don't use them because we're we're not designing buildings. So we pay a premium for those video cards that we don't really need. What we really need in our workstation workstations are like uh, gaming caliber video cards. Those are the sorts of things that Cave does, you know, the, the shader sort of operation. So we're trying to kind of change how the acquisition process goes and not spend a lot of money on video cards uh, with capabilities that we never use, and in spend, instead spend the money on video cards that are far more capable in the areas that we really do use. I know I'm kind of getting down in the hardware weeds there, but I, I wanted to to kind of kind of bring you up to speed on on what we were trying to accomplish with this. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, Eric in Chicago. I, um, you know, I, I kind of like the idea that you're uh, proposing. The, um, you know, there are there are some advantages in having a separate text workstation, and um, I don't know if those were necessarily addressed. But one I was thinking of, and maybe other offices can comment, is uh, the practice of uh, occasionally having warning teams where one person's really uh, buried in the radar data and the partner will uh, be working on the text products, so the radar operator really doesn't have to take their eyes away. And that, um, that is obviously facilitated by having a dedicated text workstation. Um, has something like that been um, addressed in your uh, new paradigm? Yeah, we've, we've, had, uh, we've had discussions about, about just those sorts of operations and you know, and like I said, we uh, you know we need to have some um, we need to gather a lot of input, and you know, and it might be that you know we we need to to flex a little bit on what we're proposing here, and it, and it might also be that the uh, you know that that perhaps the the field needs to needs to think about some new ways of 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 doing business uh, because yeah and I've I've been in those warning situations where you know one person is is immersed in the radar data and someone else is actually writing the warnings uh, but is you know is necessarily a dedicated text workstation the best way to do that or you know there there are lots of possibilities uh, that that we can that we can discuss uh, with in regard to this and we're you know at this point we're open to all of them and maybe there's maybe there's somewhere in the middle that that uh, the, you know, existing ways of doing business and a new way of doing business, you know, maybe we can meet in the middle somewhere. And that's why, you know, if, uh, you know, if, if any of you have a sleepless night one night and you think, oh, hey, I just thought of the best way to handle the, this text workstation thing, you know, shoot Bill and I a, an email or just me or, or whatever. And, you know, we, we want to take in as, as much field uh, as much field input as we can get on this, you know, we, you know, we know you folks out there in the field are the ones that are ultimately using this, not, uh, you know, not Bill and I sitting here in our cubicles. So we want to, we want to make sure that it's a good work environment and one that the the field is comfortable with too. 
Yeah, this is Scott again at MBRC, and I know we're getting a little bit in the weeds, but I think a lot of these type of issues that are being brought up, which are good issues, I think a lot of them can be solved with software solutions versus hardware solutions as far as you know, keeping the way we're operating today hardware-wise just to do some certain functionality. I think we can do some software solutions so people can continue to function with warning teams, even though we get rid of XT or, work, or get rid of the text workstations um, only functionality. Right, and and as far as those software solutions go, at at some point we will we will necessarily have to engage Raytheon in this process, and you know the uh, they're, they're developers in Omaha, they're the ones that that really know what you know what all the possibilities are with with cave and the eclipse framework and i don't know but what those guys you know they might say oh hey you know here's here's capability foobar that we've never shown you within the eclipse framework what do you think of this and you know we may go oh wow this this is fantastic we never thought of this so you know that that's another aspect uh, to to all this is the the smart programmer guys up there may have some fabulous software solution that we haven't even thought of. Uh, a, a quick point of clarification to piggyback on Matt's comments about the importance of that we all share about you know field involvement and endorsement that when if we do get some support to prototype a few options um, and spin up some experiments within the proving ground, we will bring in forecasters from some of your offices to run through those experiments. It wouldn't be you know, a handful of us who uh, are not um, you know, working day after day in the field to make those decisions. All right. Um, sorry for this to be one way again, but the um, activation board over the last few weeks have been uh, reviewing and monitoring the 13.4 uh, release. And they have decided for a conditional vote to proceed with a 30-day test for the Group 1 sites beginning September 19th at 12Z, which is Monday. So the Group 1 30-day test looks like it's going to begin. Um, as soon as they begin, that would mean that Group 2 could start doing their uh, um, their uh, the variation uh, get um, training, get that started, and get that completed for the 30 days, so group two. And I think group two would be, Demo that's uh, currently Des Moines, Milwaukee, and La Crosse. And then they would be up next. And then I think for group three, I think that's tentatively scheduled already for uh, Pueblo, Grand Junction, and Hastings. So just to give you a, a heads up on that. Uh, the 30-day test would end September 18th at 12Z if everything goes correctly and is scheduled. So, and remember, the the three main things that they're looking at in the 30-day test is performance, any critical one DRs, and stability. So, if um, I think the performance has already been met, so we're looking at any critical one DRs that would be opened up during this 30-day test. Um, and that would be rated through the TRG group. Um, if there are any identified critical ones, um, that basically, it doesn't reset the clock, but it basically stops. Well, it would delay us going on to the next step until that critical one is uh, corrected or validated. And then on the stability, um, that would be any rollbacks um, emergency service backups or failure to properly disseminate products. And those are reviewed as, on a case-by-case -case basis by the, uh, um, by the evaluation uh, activation board. So anyway, so can that's you, what we have. Yeah. Can you repeat the starting day? I thought you said September 19th or is it? Oh, I'm sorry, August, August 19th. Okay. This Monday, coming up okay. Monday. Sorry. Hey, Greg, I, this is Dan in La Crosse. I've got a question for you. Sure. It seems like, and this is just my personal take, but um, you know, when I'm, when I'm looking for software for AWIPS now, that whole migration has seemed to 
I don't know, somewhat leave us in a in a different area with the SVN and and where our software repository is or the SCP now. Um, I guess I'm wondering um, what do you feel is the success of that that new infrastructure and how well do people know it? Um, I know it's migrated probably more to the IT side, but I just talk to people and they're just generally not happy with how the ease um, as to to get a software program in there and and learn how to do some of those things uh, with the new SCP. Um, do you have any feedback on that? Um, you know, I'll punt to Matt because he's had more experience using it than I have. Hey, Dan, this is Matt in Rapid City. I can give you feedback right now. Um, I'm done developing apps and, and fiddling with that stuff because I find it extremely cumbersome to use. It was so nice before when we had the, uh, the repository online. Yeah, it seemed really straightforward. And um, when, I've, when I've talked to some different people about it, you know, the wiki pages are just really endless and, and detailed. And it, it's, I, I just find myself, at least, getting confused. And then I talk to other people and you know, they don't find it the easiest in the world either. I don't. I, I don't agree, hundred percent. Well, it is. It, you know, it's a change in how we do business from the lab. There's no doubt about that. Uh, the lab was basically just a bunch of tar files sitting on a server. Uh, there was no way to control the code. There was no way to collaborate on code. Um, you know. Yeah, it, it absolutely is uh, a different way of of submitting applications, but it, it it's a more controlled way of of submitting code. And I've personally I've I've found it to be really handy for for the LDAD model manager. I've been collaborating with Josh Watson at Eastern Region, and each of us can make changes to the code and submit it and when we decide it's stable we you know we tag a release as 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 uh, the latest stable and make an update on the wiki page and automatically everyone that's a registered user of the application gets a notification email that there's an update available uh, users can open trouble tickets against the software uh, none of this was possible with the LAD. So, yeah, it's it's certainly different from the LAD, uh, but it's it's far more sophisticated and powerful than than the LAD ever hoped. Because the 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 LAD was was nothing but uh, a web page with with a server full of tar files behind it. There there was no sophistication to it at all. There was no ticketing system. There was no you know there it it was. Right. So I mean, I hear your I hear your frustrations, uh, and, and there is a learning curve with it. Uh, but I think Paul Jendrowski at Roanoke has has done a, a decent job in in putting instructions together on how to use it. And Paul is is pretty available to to give some one on one help if you're having trouble with it. Yeah, there's definitely some positives with it. I, and I've talked to Paul about it a little bit, and I've asked him that maybe this is just a training issue. Um, you know, maybe that, maybe, you know, he's like, well, I put all these wiki pages together, and, you know, maybe there's maybe there's some, some other ideas on tra training avenues or media that, and some different media that would work there that, that we could explore for, for getting people better up to speed on how to use that. I, I don't know. It's Are you on the feedback? I was dev? curious what people were thinking, but it, it's just you know, I, t I told Paul straight out. There's a lot of wiki pages there, and I kind of get buried in it all, and um, I don't know. Yeah, that that and if, feedback, if there's you know, maybe if there's it's a training one, issue. yeah, I I think there's a, in large part it is a training issue, but that one one kind of one complaint I have with it is. It would be nice if there was somewhere you could go to just kind of see everything that's available. Right now, I don't know of any way to to really do that. You know, kind of like a an index 
of, of what's on the FCP. Um, Greg was just bringing up, uh, Paul just uh, sent on the AWIPS2 dev list uh, a, a fairly lengthy uh, explanation of what the SCP is and what it is not. Uh, I don't know how many of you are on AWIPS2 dev. Maybe I ought to just take that uh, take that email, and, oh, and Greg's telling me now that, uh, that John Olson at headquarters also provided some input. Would it be useful uh, for us to forward those emails to cr.su, or, or you know, what, what do you all think? Or who, who, might, who might be a, a good audience for those? Uh, well, I think I guess if we want to read them, we could just log into the list server to that and uh, look at that dev um, email list. Yeah, I um, guess if if you're involved in in development, um, maybe you're already on that list. I would think that yeah, that's true for most people. Um, and I agree with what you're saying, Matt, about there being improvements to this. But I just find it really terribly confusing. It seems like it's written by IT people for IT people. And it's, it's potentially going to cut a lot of the uh, operational folks who develop programs out of the loop. Like I said, I just I, I kind of gave up on it. It just it isn't intuitive. That's the problem for me. Yeah, Matt, this is Brett at Riverton. I'm in exactly the same boat as Dan and Matt. I use the LAD and the STR a ton, all the time. Not that I was putting things up there, but I was getting things from other people. I've only maybe pulled one thing off the SCP, and I stopped. And, th and this is just someone who's pulling stuff. I'm not collaborating anything. This is just getting things from there. It is so non-user friendly. For the, yeah, for the, the person who wants to go grab what content. other people have developed and, and put it on your system is not helpful at all. I, somebody had a comment from the RFC. Yeah, this has got an MBRC, and we kind of had the, had the same experience with it. And I'm thinking it's more of a training issue. Um, I'm thinking, you know, maybe there might be a better issue. And maybe there is a module out there on the LMS on how to use the system. But to me, you know, a collection of wiki pages does not make a training program. So uh, maybe there is something that, you know, for training that could help out everybody to have a better understanding. Yeah, and if, if you've if you've looked at you know if you've visited, you know Paul's wiki pages, you know I think he has one that, that's pretty basically entitled "How to SCP." If there's something in there that that's confusing to you, you know by all means, you know s send Paul an email and say, "Hey, the, these steps are not clear. Is is there some way that that this could be?" You know, could this be worded more clearly, or you know, because um, yeah, I mean, if if it's if if there are problems, even just simply getting stuff from it and not checking stuff in, then uh, then that that those are issues that need to be addressed.